I loved this one. Something different, a breath, a breath of fresh air, which every episode is different, of course, because it's somebody else's story and journey. But Jack is somebody I feel very fortunate to have spent time with um, outside of the salon. And I, he just brings this next level of self-discovery and self-thought. And I, um, I think this is something really different than what I've had on the podcast as up till now, maybe it was much more almost mental health focused and his, his deep connection and how he's taking that and leading that into the industry. So my guest today, if I haven't said I'm all wrapped up in it is Jack Morton, who is working through Tony and Guy, but he is the creative director for Australia Wella Professional and New Zealand, sorry, Wella Professional Australia and New Zealand and the Australian fame team. So Jack has been with Tony and Guy for over 20 years, worked for them in the UK, which is a common thread throughout my segments, I think is this Tony and Guy um, network. And I just really love hearing how going through that company has brought up so many incredible hairdressers and people and some of my favorite people have, have gone through there. So Jack also is starting and has started this well-being focused program called Project U, which is so needed for our industry and just for anybody through this time. I just really appreciated him diving into his story of how hairdressing helped him find himself too in a time when maybe he was just discovering things and that it was this safe space that you could be yourself when you're in a hair salon. And I just found it really beautiful hearing that and hearing his story. And I can never get enough of talking to him. And also something that we spoke about just career wise was how he is a specialized colorist and that that can be very difficult sometimes and how to allow yourself to go further in the industry and collaborating with people, but still have it be your own. That's something that I've struggled with. I think thinking about going out on my own, how will I do it as someone who is specifically a colorist? So I found that really interesting, but this is definitely an episode that I think you should not miss. They're all good, but this is, yeah, a really good one. Pulls on your heartstrings and I had goosebumps the whole time. So I hope you really enjoyed this episode with myself and Jack Morton. Okay. It never used to say recording in progress. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not so I don't know. It never used to do that. Now I'm like, oh, now I can't sneak attack people and just <laughs> start the recording without them knowing. Sometimes that's when I get the best stuff, you know? <laughs> I'm going to find out how to mute that. <laughs> but today I'm on with Jack Morton. I always want to go say Jack Morton creative. Like I always have people's Instagram <laughs> handles. Handle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's actually a few Jack Mortons. Do you know this? Yeah, there's actually a global uh, like branding company called yeah. Jack Morton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cuz I was googling <laughs> you cuz you know <laughs> I was doing that. Not because I needed info, because I um I was looking for a photo of you that was in color cuz you sent me a black and white one, which is Oh uh, yeah. And then it came up with all I was like, "Oh, this is a popular name. Popular guy." Yeah, common. Common. <laughs> hey, nothing common about you. We're going to find out, aren't we? <laughs> you too kind. <laughs> Oh, so I've been really looking forward to this one with you and nice that we can do it in an evening too. I like that it wasn't so rush, rush in the morning. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm definitely not a, a morning person. You wouldn't have got the best out of me in the morning. <laughs> so I've been up, I've exercised, I've moved, I've been a bit productive and I've poured a wine. So um, yeah, you've got me at my best. So. Ready to roll. Amazing. Um, well, I would love to just start with a bit of your background. I'm lucky to know you a bit personally and outside of yeah. totally being in work times. We're usually out on Chapel Street having a drink. <laughs> but I would love to know your story and how you got into hairdressing. I know that you are very artistic, which is something I think that's so cool and translates so well. But how did that navigate you into hair? And yeah. Yeah, look, it's... um. I guess like all the best things in life, it's it was a complete accident. I, I was um, an art and design student and I had a place at uni doing fashion styling and photography, oh. which if I'm honest, like I hadn't started the course yet. Um, 
but it also wasn't something I like was really passionate about. I knew I wanted to do something creative. And I think one of my best mates at the time also applied for the course. So I was like, oh yeah, that seems cool. I'll do that. And um, around that time, I was quite alternative. You know, I was 17. I had like a shaved head with like a big bleach stripe in it. And I had a lot of facial piercings and I would like wear my jeans inside out just to be different. Cool. And, um, you know, this is like 20 years ago. And the town that I'm from, which is like, you know, just outside North London, it was, you know, it wasn't like a country town, but also it wasn't like overly welcoming of anybody to alternative. Plus the time that we were in, it was quite hard to find jobs if you had like facial piercings and a big yeah. stripe in your hair. And um, it was my auntie. I couldn't find a job. I just needed a part-time job until I went off to uni. And it was actually my auntie who said, oh, you should go and work in a hairdresser. It's like, I think a hairdresser would have you. That would, it would be a good, that'd be a good fit for you. But actually, without getting like too deep and too profound too quickly, I think <laughs> oh, dive right her, in. Suggest- I'm here for <laughs> her suggesting me to go and work at a hairdresser's, I know very much came from a place of her recognising in me that I was gay and I hadn't quite mm. kind of figured that out yet and was maybe denying it to myself a bit. And it was like, oh, yeah, you know, hairdressing has always been such an incredibly safe place for people to express themselves, especially, yeah. you know, for people that do identify as gay and queer and um, that was her saying yeah that, mm-hmm. that's your people you should go there so you know and I hadn't quite figured that out and in the area where I work, lived sorry there was two cool places to work it was either Virgin Megastore you know the record store which I'd already worked at and I'd been fired oh. um <laughs> so, so the yeah, only other place <laughs> <laughs> the only other place was Tony and Guy and I was like okay I'll go and if, um, if I'm going to work in the hairdressers, then I want to work for, you know, a branded hairdresser, somewhere yeah. that I know. And um, so, yeah, I walked into Tony and Guy with my jeans inside out and bleach stripe in my hair. And I think I had my portfolio with me at the time. And the the owner there, you know, I said, do you need any anyone to sweep floors or answer phones, make tea? Just like a, a hand, you know, a salon hand. And he was like, oh, not really, but we're, we're looking for apprentices. Like, is it something, is that something that's ever appealed to you? And I thought, look, I won't tell him I'm going to uni. I'll just mm. do it for six weeks, just for like somewhere to be for a few weeks. And, um, and that was kind of it. You know, I, I, I started and just loved it. I, it was everything, I, like I said, it was this very much safe place to express yourself, you know, listen to cool music. The energy was amazing um something about the owner there John Mariano was his name he um he very much employed personality Mm. um and you know there's this philosophy I think within Tony and Guy so it's like Tony and Guy will will make you great you don't have to be brilliant like you've got you've got to bring a bit of something and he very much employed people with like a bit of something so the space in there was just fun and loud and creative and um yeah I just got sucked in it's the best um, place to be working at that age I think too that's when I started uh, my first salon job and like oh my god I was and obviously this is like the other side but I'm like I was going out drinking on the weekends and like we had all these salon parties and like it was just the the best place to be was in the staff lunchroom and you know you always absolutely your clients so that oh I know I want to have lunch with these people so I'm going to make sure my client finishes here you know it's just yeah, this like, place. we were naughty as well. Like we we hired bottles of like Smirnoff ice in the in the big giant cotton wool <laughs> um bag in the in the colour room. Like we were we were naughty, but but we were enjoying ourselves. We were fun, and I think that spilled out into our clients. Like our clients were um like our friends as well. Like our boss would often like with the last couple of clients of the day, like sit and have a drink with them. Yeah. So as much as we would you know, like you said, like have a lot of fun and rebel and be a bit naughty. Like it wasn't like us and the clients. It was, it was that culture mixed the two together. It was, it was a brilliant. Yeah. Sometimes I find that hard even now being on my own that I could sit with them Mm. and have a wine, you know, like they're having a wine and I'm like, Oh, I'd like one, but I'm like, Oh no, I can't cross the line. Like, you know, I think, I think clients like it. Like the amount of times I offer my clients a wine and they'll be like, are you going to have one? You know, yeah. they, they want to be part of it. And I don't know if you remember maybe going into salons before you worked in a salon and feeling like, oh, this space is cool and I want to be mm. a, I want to be a part of that space. And I think clients still have that. You know, it's a it's a family, it's a culture that they want to be 
part of not just to kind of dip in and out of it's, yeah, um, true. yeah come into so the family right. you know yeah so did you end up going to uni like did you do no what so happened? yeah look I was super lucky where um my boss caught wind of the fact that I was going to go off to uni and he was like look I think you've got a lot of potential like how about you because I reckon I could fast track you he said how about look, we need a colorist because I was like something about cutting never appealed to me I don't know what it was I did a couple yeah. of models and I just oh, I don't know I just like holding the hair I didn't get it I didn't want to do it more importantly mm-hmm. but something about color was so appealing you know I guess I understood the the laws and philosophies around color and the color wheel color and I was wheel, comfortable yeah. holding a brush you know because I yeah. I paint do abstract paintings and um yeah it just really intrigued me so he's like look get some models in let's see how you go see how you feel and I think I just um yeah, I just really embraced it. And he was like, look, I'll do you a deal. Because you've got this place at uni. He said, you defer uni for a year and I'll get you qualified within a year. Oh, wow. And um, and I and I don't mind admitting this, but it, this has very much been a chip on my shoulder. Um, but this was a different time as well. I very I didn't actually qualify as a hairdresser. So I didn't do my, like, TAFE, my MBQ. Yeah. It was all done a bit dodgy. You know, I kind of qualified as a colorist. So I didn't yeah. do cutting. I didn't blow dry like if anyone if you've worked with me at all you'll know I like I can get hair really straight but I can't do a body <laughs> blow dry that's good. I can't oh yeah yeah that's the, that's the one that's thing I can do really quite hard to do <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where it ends you know like okay. anything with a bit of a with a round brush body like nothing so I didn't I didn't actually do any cutting or blow drying it was purely color um but I I've always regretted it I've always had this like oh say, chip yeah. on my shoulder you know and I think it's I think it's because I feel like a bit of a fraud you know mm, um no. but I think in some ways maybe this is where I've tried to overcompensate from a color perspective because yeah. I wasn't like this fully fledged hairdresser um I so yeah, completely relate I, I never did it. my um you can get like um you're supposed to get your license kind of more so in America yeah. but in Canada it was coming in when I was finishing kind of so all of my mentors some of them didn't have it and it was like if you had one to every five with a license you didn't need it and I was like oh I'm not doing that like you know could not be bothered going and doing the test and I had to it was on everything perms and cutting and I was the same thing just Mm. loving color and I regret it so much now even though you don't need your license over here just it would be such a pain in the ass now to do it you know like yeah I feel like sometimes I'm like oh I don't want to tell anybody that I didn't actually do it you know yeah and it's advice I always give to the the younger guys as well like if there's part of your foundations that you just like really push back against whether it's permit or hair up or particular Mm. haircuts like and even color you know for people that love styling like just get those foundations because it will come in handy later on even just knowing how things are done like I have the I understand how haircuts work and you know somebody can tell me what layering pattern they're going to do and I can work my color around it etc but but yeah I think it's just been that it's contributed to the imposter syndrome so I think yeah to, to younger guys like if there's something that you shy away from actually that's the thing that you should be embracing and um you, you might end up loving it even more I wonder if I'd pushed myself whether I would have ended up being a stylist because like now when I do my um color collections like for HFAs etc I do choose the shapes like I choose a shape and a haircut Mm. that's going to show off an interesting color technique but then I I can't physically do it so it's a it's a bit of a frustration and a block you know yeah I totally get that and that was something before when we before I hit record and she announced that I was recording um I was saying to you something I really do want to dive into is the fact that you are a solely a colorist because a lot of the awards and a Mm. lot of the um collections are heavily focused on the cutting and styling whereas for me my eyes all I see is color I don't see anything else like Mm. I have no idea what haircuts in there happening in there you know like that's Mm. exactly where my eyes go is to that and I have felt Mm. how am I going to either go out on my own as a hairdresser or how am I gonna do a collection when I don't have that vision of how to get to point b how have you worked through that and been able to create these great collections by having somebody else like and where does that credit I sometimes I feel like you win say Australian colorist of the year but somebody doesn't get the credit who did the star all this you mm. know a little bit I find yeah, that yeah yeah 
Yeah, totally. Yeah, look, it's been such an interesting journey doing the photographic collections. And again, I would really encourage everyone to give it a go at some stage to you know pull together six eight looks that um you know reflect you reflect your skill set reflect your taste level because it's that's it's such a cathartic experience like whether you're proud or happy of the work afterwards or not like you learn so much from it yeah. and i was it was suggested to me i think my you know my boss joe smith the owner of the tony and guy that i work in and dennis langford the owner of tony Guy australia they kind of probably recognized I was having a bit of a wobbly moment in my career like you know I was happy I'd been teaching but I wasn't really sure what was next you know we all hit these blocks of like oh my god is this do I just do this now for the next 35 years of my life That's like life even if you're happy down. it's just like what what is next what's next and they're like look maybe you do maybe you should do a photographic collection like, like we'll, you know we'll, we'll support you and um I think it'd be great for you and a creative like it'd be great for you to just uh yeah, put down and print your your looks and I always really pushed back against photographic work because especially from a color perspective like I, I never feel like a photo fully captures what it looks like in the flesh like hair needs to move you know like mm. and there's so much trickery and lighting involved and blah and blah blah especially color so, especially color yeah absolutely and um I was working with Matt Webb as a photographer who was also a hairdresser at the time and he gave me some really good advice at the beginning he said look you should design some shapes around like think of your color techniques that you want to show off and then what shapes lend themselves well to that color technique so, you know, I was thinking, okay, I will do something with a focal point, something with a graduation of color, something with textured color. So I came up with all of kind of those techniques first and then thought, all right, well, what, what shapes lend themselves well to that? Um, so that's how I kind of came up with my, my first collection. And that was very much a team. All of my collections really are team collections. Like I work with all of the stylists in my salon. So the first collection was very much a mixture of everybody in the salon. Um, deciding on these shapes and then I have gone on to pre ne the following years where I've said okay Joe you enter this in Victorian and you kind of direct the shapes and then I'll kind of color those shapes in and I'll enter colorist but there's it that type of approach doesn't work for me or for us because I feel like there's there's too much of a compromise yeah. for one or the other and that's just us you know there are some brilliant stylists and colorists like Danny and Jamie from the Yang they're mm -hmm. a perfect example of color and cut working in complete synergy yeah. and they're both incredibly successful in their own rights but I think with some of the stylists I've tried to do that with we're probably a bit too like either too different or too similar or too polite where it's oh no no, no you, you decide it's not your that vision and, coming like, to life anymore yeah totally so the, my most successful shoots have always been a real team effort like I'll come up with a rough direction around the styling and the references and then we'll sit down as a team and then everybody has their two cents yeah you so know? you have so. one person doing one look another so that it's not just one stylist helping you that's a great tip absolutely yeah yeah that's that's worked that. really well for us and even that one look you know sometimes like, I'm actually in the middle of my prep for my current shoot and um you know I had one of the ideas one of the girls was cutting one of the looks yesterday but then on the day, somebody else actually might be kind of styling or they'll do half of the styling or say, can you can you help me yeah. out here? So it's a full team effort. There's no there's no ego involved from a styling perspective. There's not there's not too much ownership around the Each styling. In it. Yeah. So that it can still be yeah. yours a little bit for that to be it was your idea and it's been collaborated yeah. on. I get you. Cool. OK, but I think it's like I would. I, yeah, go. sorry, go. You go. No, you go. Oh, I was gonna say I would I would never enter um one of my collections into say Victorian hairdresser or Australian hairdresser because it's it's such a team effort that I could not take any responsibility really? for the, the styling. So I think yeah, so like conceptually, yes, but you know, it's all it's all them hand it's all their handwork. So yeah. like no, I couldn't I couldn't do that. Interesting. I reckon that's a little bit of you, though, you know, having that syn syndrome that you said, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, that's yeah, yeah. you, you could, yeah. you could. Yeah, yeah. But right. I feel like we jumped, I couldn't resist the urge, but I like to go in order. I'm very pedantic like that, okay. where I'm like, oh, no, if I go there, then I can't get back to how you got to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. No, you didn't go to uni. You fit? Did you finish? You fast tracked in the one year? Did you do it in one year? Oh, I, even less. I think it was like. Oh my god. About eight months. Yeah, just went hard out, like full 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 time training. Yeah. yeah. And I, like, I mean, I, I worked really hard. Um, I came in on my days off. I was a bit of a jobs work. You know, I was a bit obsessed with it all. I loved it. Really, really, I soaked it all up. And um, I worked really hard. But I was really, really fortunate that people invested in me you know the guys in the salon that trained me and that I had this the owner you know John there that took a chance on me and saw potential in me and um and and pushed me and um I did hit again a bit of a wobbly moment at the end thinking oh my god I can't do this oh my god I don't want to do this and kept kept calling in sick and he would um come around come around to my house and like knock on the door and like one check that I was okay and then two check that Actually, I wasn't sick and then dragged me to work. Yeah, so, um, I think yeah. it is really important. And what I really try to get out of these podcasts is what I want to be um, given, I guess, to people in high school who are thinking about hairdressing or hairdressers mm-hmm. starting out in their apprenticeship, because here it's quite a long journey. It can be three years oh. going through it. And I think it is really important to hear from people that they didn't maybe love it right away or they didn't love all aspects mm. of it right away because it can seem a bit consuming. And it is. Mm. If you love it, you know, like I don't sit at home on my night off doing this, you know, I just like talking, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> we we I felt the same way like there's moments where I'm like is this for me no matter how good you are at it no matter how many awards you win or accolades or all these things that you have I think it is really important to hear I didn't love it the whole time (laughs) or uh, there was moments where I wanted to quit yeah and you know like I've mentioned a couple of times like it's about having people believe in you and I think like you know us as qualified hairdressers or these senior hairdressers like we have to look at these. We're not qualified. And <laughs> <Just don't know. laughs> these, these unqualified senior idiots, and and look at these younger guys and take the time to get to know them, to understand what they love, what they hate, who they are as people, and to oh, just just believe in them and like know that other people believe in them. And um, yeah, we really need to be nurturing the younger guys a lot more as an industry. I think we've we've moved into a space in the world where we live in such a narcissistic culture you know where it's all about us as individuals and we're all filled with crippling anxiety we're all just trying to like promote ourselves with instagram but we kind of forget about everybody else around us especially the younger people and um yeah i wouldn't have got to where i was today without the older hairdressers looking after me and i think you know it's nice now to recognize that I know I'm one of those older hairdressers that needs to see the potential in younger guys, get to know them and nurture them and check in on them and support them and um, pick them up when they're having their wobbly moments, you know? Love it. So you have been with Tony and Guy for over 20 years, is that correct? So you're still yeah. with Tony and Guy, but now in Australia. So how did that transition happen? And how have you, have you left at all? You've always stayed. I, I oh, a little <laughs> controversial thing. I said, hey, no, um, so look, I, I'd been qualified for a few years in the UK and I think it was always drummed into me by my family like you know as soon as you're old enough just travel the world you know go and live in Australia my my uncle lives over here my dad I think if he hadn't had kids so young he probably would have traveled the world and just jetted off when he was young and lived over here as well so I think he was living through me he's always encouraged me to like travel the world go to Australia and then yeah so I think I had it in the back of my head like oh yeah you know Tony Guy global company Mm. um at the time there was around oh Tony Guy was really expanding over here in Australia and uh, I know they were looking for staff I can't remember how I even knew that but um I remember just thinking yeah I'll go and do a year in Australia at some stage and I remember it's actually I've totally forgotten about this until talking to you now I was um with my housemate and I was like yeah I'll go and work in Australia one day and they were like well when are you gonna go when are you gonna do it I was like and I'd had a few drinks I was like I'm gonna call them now I'm gonna call them now I like looked up Tony and Guy Australia head office number and called them after a few drinks and, oh like, oh, I'm looking down the and then that kind of got the ball rolling and the guy you who there, you said it <laughs> You're like, oh, shit, yeah no, exactly them. <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> and um funnily enough the guy Stuart Freeman who was the master franchisee for Victoria at the time he was going to be in London a few weeks later 
So he was like, look, well, maybe if you want to meet up with Stuart, he's going to be in London and you know, have, have kind of an interview. Yeah. And, um, and I did and was like, OK, I'll, I'll transfer. I'll go and do, do a year thinking like that would be it. Story like, of my life. All, all of us, uh, you know, I, and I've had this conversation with you and many other British hairdressers over here or expats. And um, yes, yeah, so I transferred and um, I think it was so lovely. I didn't know anyone here at all. I knew I had a job. Um, but you know, I knew I had a job at Tony and Guy, and everything mm-hmm. looks the same. The language is the same. It was yeah, you just kind of slotted in. So I had it so comfortable. But then it was everything else in my life where I fell flat on my face. You know, I didn't didn't know myself. I didn't have any friends. I was um, yeah, just a bit a bit lost as a person. Yeah. But Tony and Guy was a very safe place for me. And so um, nice. yeah, it was it was brilliant. But then I think again on reflection, when you really start digging around, like I think I'd been here for just under a year and I I was happy with work but I probably wasn't happy in life as a person and I think the easiest thing to do when you don't know who you are or what you want is to leave a job you know you're not leaving a, a romantic or, or you know whatever we do we, yeah, we totally. might leave a partner or we might move house or for me at that time should I say it was easy enough to just I didn't have control of my life the easiest thing to do was to leave leave my job and I kind of left Tony and Guy in a bit of a, a huff one day and I actually went to work for Bieber oh. um I, I was like do you know what? I want to teach I want to teach full time and um so I went to work at the Johnston Street Academy in, in um for Bieber and I wasn't there for long but I have such fondness of that time there like Lyndall Salmon was one of the students and um we got on really well and we'd sneak out on lunch and have a tequila and <laughs> Um, what I ha- why that was such a profound time for me, and this is something I always try to share this story, is um, moving into teaching full time was so, so rewarding. You know, sharing your knowledge with other people. These students were so brilliant. They were so hungry for it, especially, you know, the students that went to the Beaver Academy who were super yeah. creative. And then they all wanted to learn. And they were, a lot of them were like the same age as me, you know? Oh. And um and it also got my confidence up in teaching yeah. that because I was teaching, I was being asked all the time, what do you know? What do you know? What do you know? And you were like, you know, I know stuff. <laughs> I, might, I know, I know stuff. qualified, but I know stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. And it was, <laughs> it was teaching that got my confidence up as a person. And I made yeah. all these brilliant friends. And, and I think then I got into this great headspace of like, okay, I'm okay as a person. I love hairdressing. I didn't want to leave Tony and Guy, you know, it, that wasn't the problem. Yeah. And I, you know, I went, I went back with my head hanging low like, after three months. I went back to oh Stuart my God, said, really? yeah, look, I, I made a mistake. You know, I was just a bit lost at the time. Like, will, will you have me back? And he was like, yeah, of course. And, you know, I left Bieber on great terms. Again, I look back so fondly on them. That was, they have a brilliant set up there and, um, and they connections. Kind of, you know, it, yeah. And then, yeah, so I've, I've been back at Tony and Guy well I guess I mean not that I've moved backwards and forwards so I went back to Tony and Guy had a great time but then I actually moved back to the UK for a couple of years I was like, okay I've done three years in Australia it's time to go now go back home and then I loved it back at home I appreciated everyone and um, you know I went back to like training in Tony and Guy London doing a little bit of teaching here and there and then um I just missed the friends that I'd made here I was like mm. still on a journey oh, with them yeah so I was like, I'm having deja vu of being out with you the other night. And I'm like, oh, I, I know we were talking about this the other night. Like, this. We have these great, like deep conversations. What would we have been drinking? And I'm like, this is the good shit. Now I'm so sober. <laughs> you can remember it. Yeah, press record. Um, but yeah, so again, those lessons for like, it's okay to to go back somewhere like me going yeah. back to Tony and Guy and then going back to England and being like no do you know what actually it this isn't what I want I want to go back to Australia yeah. and also to just to look at things it's not things aren't better or worse the grass isn't always greener but it's um somewhere and something just serves a purpose for you at a particular time in your yeah. life totally. you know I loved Bieber and I loved working back in the UK but right now I needed to be back in Australia and to keep nurturing those 
friendships that I had and um so yeah I've been back now for 11 11 years wow and, um, and yes, was that quite e- like how did you go about a visa process then was it easier then I'm like mm. oh that's great that you left and came back how, how did you do that <laughs> yeah I mean again life. very lucky because I was sponsored by Tony and Guy yeah. um you know hairdressing was still very much oh, on the skilled migrants the, list I get you yeah so yeah and it, it changed not too long after that it's gotten mm-hmm. a lot harder as we all know there's a lot of brilliant hairdressers struggling to get over here and um, so yeah it was it was a great timing thing I was very fortunate oh how cool and then you have some really amazing accolades as well as <laughs> a creative director do you want to go into cool. those for Oz fame team and Wella so how did those kind of happen oh. <laughs> yeah both like what where where are we at yeah um oh, it's so funny I get a bit awkward about like like <gasps> titles you know really okay (laughs) yeah it's just a bit like like director is such a like it sounds so corporate doesn't it or it sounds so like important or but I think when you put creative creative in front of it it was a creative director (laughs) but I think this is where I have like the problem is like creativity for me I know it's such a subjective thing isn't it and Mm. um yeah to kind of put this title on on top of me of like creative director it's like well I'm not saying what's right or wrong I'm just giving like it's your my opinion. suggestion yeah yeah you know and that's what I always have to remember with creativity it's, it's just my opinion it's not right totally. or wrong um but yes look I've got um you know well out I've always been a massive support of mine and again down to the personable connections I've made within the company like um Ludmilla um who looks after the guest artists with Wella I think she again was somebody who's always seen potential in me as being a passionate teacher and she likes my creative thought process and um always feel felt like I represented the brand well so she put me forward as one of the creative directors and um you know I think anybody that wants to maybe align with a product company I think where I've always done well with product companies and yeah. Weller in particular is I'm always very I'm always very aware of my position is that my job is to make you look good you know I, I want to show the color off like what can I do for you like yes you've put me in that position because of my um, maybe articulation around teaching and my creative uh, aesthetic but I'm also very respectful and I'm quite mm. easy to get on on with as a creative director or an, a, a, an ambassador should I say and I think that's put me in good stead um, yeah. and so I always, yeah, again, thank Ludmilla for putting me in that position. So yeah, with Wella. So were you um, educating for Wella and then she put you in for that role? Like, how did that happen that you got in with Wella? Because it's been a conversation yeah. that I've been having on where I want to go. And I definitely know that color and education is what I see filling part of that career path for me. But something mm. that's come up with the big brands such as Wella, L'Oreal, those things is that, mm. oh, well, you might not want to try going in with them right away because they're so big and they have so many people. And so how did you mm. find you were able to work your way up within such a large umbrella, a large company and create yeah, okay. for yourself? Did you hear that? Have Did you find that or was it different or? Yeah, look, that's a, it's a good question actually. So I, um, I started teaching with Tony and Guy, you know, when I came back from Biba and with Tony and Guy, we, you know, we've worked with Wella now for, I think, 15, 16 years exclusively wow. as a product company. Do all the Tony guys use Wella? Um, all the Tony guys in Australia, we have a contract um, with Wella, oh, so we use them yeah. exclusively. In the UK, it's about 50-50 with L'Oreal. Oh, yeah. um, and then around the world, there are some other brands. But yeah, Wella and L'Oreal are the big powerhouses. And um, so in Australia, exclusively with them. So when Tony and Guy do our big collection shows and our seminars, we would always partner with Wella and I mm. would te- teach for Tony and Guy, but then using I'd always you know, obviously be yeah. using Wella um, and Tony and Guy guest artists on the Wella Academy um, or the Wella calendar, should I say. So yes, Wella were very aware of, of who I, who yeah. I was and um yeah, I guess that's how it started. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so Wella, Tony and Guy, me, 
and then yeah, yeah. kind of I just love work, knowing work path, how there. it happens for everyone because everybody's yeah. is so different and something that is a common denominator in a lot of these conversations is Tony and Guy and a lot uh, of people I've had on started with them and that was you know a big thing so I do find it interesting to think to know the difference of people who worked for powerhouse kind of brands and international brands and how they got in that way yeah yeah we um you know we're quite a we're obviously a, lar- a large platform we're very very well connected and very well educated as hairdressers yeah. and um yeah that's how we got to work with well that's how I got into into this so yeah we're very fortunate and fame team is such a cool oh. thing that I have I was going to say firsthand, but I guess I'm secondhand because you know, I wasn't on the team. <laughs> <laughs> got to kind of be a part of one of the shoots and watch my friend go through the whole process. Yeah. With you and talk to me about that and how that happened for you. Were you on the fame team at one point or have you always? Been no, it? no. Like, uh, it's really funny, like talking, you know, I've obviously loved my journey with Tony and Guy. I'm still there. I've been in with them 20 years I will be with them for another 20 years I love everybody at Weller and then the fame team gig I guess I feel quite different when I start to talk about mm-hmm. it like I don't know if you know it's my face tell. goes a bit funny I, it's a it's a heart project that that whole venture is um it's a beautiful machine fame team and again it's really nice to recognize how I got into that role and it was funny enough kind of through my AHFA um process so entering colorist of the year in 2014 my um submission so when you have you have to write obviously you have to send in your biography and you have to send in like a press pack that describes your collection so your inspirations what the whole collection is about we had a communications pr company lily blue who looked after the submissions actually hang on I can't quite remember how she saw it but basically Lori Lori about this she used the she was talking about the same Uh, stuff okay so you know three brilliant women who well did work for Lily Blue Joe Coles Lori Creasy Jane McCarthy looked after the the communications and I can't remember how Lori read this submission I don't know if she read it because um she was working for the AHFAs at the time or whether she was working for Tony and Guy and organized press packs. But for some reason, she read my submission and she read my, um, the inspirations behind my collection. And was this the first and, collection you were talking about? That first yeah, one that you so did? My, yeah, the first collection in 2014, which I, <laughs> I won. You know, first year I entered, I actually won. It was all so weird and overwhelming, the whole process. And um, she said to me not many people think like you I, I love your mm. creative thought process and and she also helped look after the fame team she would do the organizing kind of behind the scenes and she and then I won so I had a bit of a title I guess yeah and then she said you know you'd be great to have the fame team for a day and just share your creative mm. thought process because these guys are all very talented but they need the education on how to conceptualize and I guess that's something I I recognize I do I love what I love doing came that's to you my, naturally that's, that's my, you yeah 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 always can I'm a conceptualist so yeah. she said look would you be interested in having them for a day and I was so blown away and I actually took a a week off work beforehand to plan this day because she said you need to allow some time in the beginning to talk about your journey and then talk to them about like how you think and how to put a concept together and it was the first time I'd ever been asked that mm-hmm. like what your story is your brain tick? and how and how do you think? And look, quick side note, let's not like, I'll be honest. Yeah, I've, I asked you to do this podcast. <laughs> and the, I wasn't going to say like, it, but yes, you did. No, 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 to be fair, I, I would have always I, asked you, but. You know, you I, I think it's brilliant that you're doing this. I, I, I love you. listening to podcasts. I love what you've done. I love you've taken the initiative. You know, hairdressers, we love talking. We love other people's stories, but we, we've got a sense, well, we've all got a bit, a bit of ego. We love talking about ourselves as well. But I think I've moved into this well-being area of education and I'm asking lots of other people all the time about their stories. And then sometimes they'll flip that back on me and go, well, what do you think? Or where did you come from? And why do you do that? And it's a bit like, oh, oh, hang on. Actually, I haven't I haven't asked myself those questions for a long time. Yeah. So when Laurie said to me, I want you to put together a presentation about your journey and 
the wisdom you've learned and where it came from and why somebody else should know it and how do you think it was a bit overwhelming like mm. so I took some time off and I probably the closest I got to a panic attack like trying to organize wow. this stuff like th- thinking how do being I think the way that you are too that would be quite confronting for you you would want it to be <laughs> yeah. so well done I know you know you would be like yeah. wanting it to be <laughs> yeah. the best presentation about you that anyone could ever give <laughs> about you yeah and, it and be a lot to of be pressure. honest you know I want it to be honest it's got to mm-hmm. be like real I don't want to just like get up there and be fluffy and tell you tell a story you've also got to think well what what use is this story to other people like of what benefit is it to anybody else and I think that's that's a lesson for any educator if you're going to get up there and talk about your story remember it's got to be about the other person so um so yeah you're absolutely right I wanted it to be to, to be really good and um so I did this day and it was one of my most favorite favorite days I was on such a high and um yeah even think about now it was brilliant and Brett McKinnon who was the creative director at the time I think he really connected with with the day as well and um you know he asked me back for another year and then when he decided to step down um he actually put me forward to take oh, wow. on his role and um which was really overwhelming I get very emotional thinking about it now of just this Again, somebody else kind of believing in you, seeing mm-hmm. you, seeing the potential in you. But I felt so young, you know. Brett's a bit older than me. He's a dad. He owns a salon. He's kind of mm-hmm. got his stuff together. And then to look at me, this kind of young, scrappy, bit all over the place, creative, to be like, oh yeah, you're you could do this role. Um, I think a lot yeah, of times we think that we're not qualified to do more than hair or, you know, a little <laughs> bit like, oh, well, how, how would I know how to do that? Like, I completely yeah. get that. Yeah, yeah. It, it was very overwhelming. Um, but it's been one of the, the best ventures of my life. Like the fame team is this, like I said, this huge machine will be the, the heart that people put into it. Like the sponsors do it because of course it's great marketing for them and their yeah. brand, but there's, there's an authenticity to it there's this this heart this love around it all there's it's so much work behind the scenes yeah um but people do it because they love it because they want these young people to have a platform and um and how do you it's the emotional development uh more than than, which is something it's the emotional development that's what I realized like very quickly after that first year of like oh hang on my job isn't to tell them no that hair isn't right or what are your yeah. ideas like there's definitely the conceptual part so where we did our AHFA shoots uh the hair expo collections and the salon international show like yes my job was to sit down and facilitate their meetings around that like what looks do you want to do what's the vibe so I did that part really well but actually it's the emotional support it's the um are they being themselves are they being authentic are they connecting with each other are they are they yeah. okay where's their head where's their head at mm, and um, so important that was the most beautiful part of it yeah and that's what would really set you apart Jack is the fact that you bring that to the table not everybody brings that to the table you know like that would be Mm. mentoring that's a deeper thing that you a deeper gift that you have to give people and why you would be great for that position well thank you I I think um I don't think I necessarily realized going into it that that's what it would be yeah um and I think Again, without <laughs> I don't want to be like super profound talking to you. But, I, love um, it. I I think because you do I have gone through this emotional journey and I think a lot of gay people do like we're forced into this space of like um you know self-reflection and putting labels to our identity and who mm-hmm. we are and again you know, moving to Australia, being very lost and then being asked to do this uh fame team mental role. Like, I've been put into positions where I've had to dig deep to find out who I am being authentic and 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 share that and um and I know how it feels to be confused about who you are and I know how brilliant it feels to be able to speak your truth and be comfortable with who you are and then how rewarding it is to help other people or point them in the right directions to, yeah. to do the same and you know I'm, I'm not like oh yeah I'm found I'm I found myself I know who I am because we always kind of take step backs and in and out of that but but yeah, to be in a position of helping other people and that emotional journey is um, a real, real privilege. But it was something I didn't realise the fame team would would be about. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and do you think that that has now led you to your new project, Project You? Like, do you think uh, that all came from each step is what's led you there? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, so, yeah, I, I've been developing this. Yeah, tell us what it is. So, like, give us a, a synopsis. It's your baby and your thing that maybe if people don't know what it is. Yeah, sure. What are you doing well, if I, you don't know? But <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, yeah, I guess the first year of doing the Fame Team uh, Creative Direction, I think what really like <clears throat> flicked a switch for me was talking to all of these brilliant, incredibly successful hairdressers around the world, doing all of these amazing mentor sessions. And all of their advice to everybody was, you know, remember who you are, remember to be yourself. And it always like bothered me because it's like, well, how do you? how do you know like who you are? How do you know when you're being yourself? So I was like, I want to, I know we learn these things you know, when you're talking in the pub with people or you have like an emotional experience and you, you do a lot more emotional growth through the tough times in life. But I wanted to create like a space um, for hairdressers to sit down, to talk, to put some pen to paper, to do some exercises, workbooks, answer some questions around who you are why you are the way you are, who you want to be and how you get there. Just emotional growth. Like, and actually the mm, other goosebumps. thing I did around this thing, oh, it's the <laughs> other thing I did was a, a little seminar at a place called School of Life, which was set up by a philosopher called Alan de Botton, um, written lots of brilliant self-help books. And there's a, a center in, um, in Melbourne. And I went and did a three hour course called How to Make Decisions. Oh. And this course, basically, it's not about them giving you answers for things they just pose lots of questions about like you know how you make your best decisions like look back on the, the good decisions you've made in life and the bad decisions you've made in life how did you make those decisions so that in the future you can make good, ones you know, again. good decisions and I found it so profound again to like sit down and yeah. ask myself well, well how do I think and I was like we we need to do this with like with hairdressers like we need to we need to take some time out with with other hairdressers to reflect on ourselves. Like I think we've lost so many brilliant staff over the years because they've been a bit like me, leaving Tony and Guy and going to Peeper. We make these decisions when we're lost and we look for answers elsewhere or mm -hmm. our change of environment, change of relationship when it's just the work on the inside that we need to do. So there was the, the school of life thing. There was the recognizing people leaving when they're just a bit lost. Um, also and feeling like you couldn't give them what they needed in that moment like maybe not you as an individual but when they're leaving mm. are you being like if I had this if we had this if yes. we had a meeting like seeing that happening and being like this is what's missing but I don't have something to put in yeah yeah absolutely so yeah all, all of those things plus you know the fame team people telling you to like remember to be yourself the answer is when you're yourself and also go into lots of seminars that were really inspiring um, saying no make sure you think about this make sure you think about that and then you go away and you don't think about it you just return to your normal life it's like no but I need to create like a course where we sit down and answer some questions about who we are so I started to pull together I did a lot of research went on a lot of courses I read a lot of books had a lot of conversations with lots of people over maybe 18 months or so and I put together like a dummy course called Project You um, also as a quick side note I know I'm jumping around a bit but love it no, I love about it. this stuff is um you know, our job as hairdressers is very much to extend understanding to our clients. It's not about to, to give our opinions on their lives. It's mm -hmm. about to ask the question, all these open questions to understand them. I think sometimes we can come away from work and be like, well, I don't really know what I think. I don't really know what my opinion is because I've given so much to somebody else. I've tried to extend all this understanding to them that I'm, I'm a bit lost. Yeah. So I wanted to create this space where we reflect on on you as a hairdresser as a person let's build your self-knowledge and um, to then build your self-esteem and your self-confidence because when those things are in place we can um you know have empathy we can understand other people and that creates more connection and then of course connection is what we need to have successful careers and that's so what, I was one like, of the biggest draw draw ins like not a draw back a draw in or something to the career is that part that's what 
I love about it. I love the people. Yeah. I love that people tell me stuff. I love that my client walks in the door crying and felt okay to do that mm. with me. Like, I love that aspect. So I think it is so important to teach us some of us that doesn't mm. come naturally or comfortable. Mm. Sometimes, you know, I'm not the most touchy person, but I'll give you a hug when you're crying. But mm. to learn those things is really, it's yeah. really amazing that you have thought of that. And I do see the need for that. Oh, it's essential and even I started this kind of pre-COVID you know I put together this dummy uh, course yeah, yeah. and um, and now it's like even more important you know like hairdressers are everybody's a bit more raw aren't they they're a bit more oh my real God, yeah. we've, stopped, we've stopped the talk of like are you going on holiday this year oh, are you yeah. doing this how's this it's like, like it's not light like... and fluffy anymore it's quite <laughs> hard absolutely i bet it's brilliant i think it's yeah. propelled our industry into the direction it needs to go yeah. but i think we need um we as hairdressers we need the tools we need the support to um reflect on ourselves to build our own emotional resilience we need to know how to handle those situations um but also we need to be heard as hairdressers mm -hmm. like like me asking you I, I would love to do this interview with you like this is a space for me to talk about me a bit today yeah but actually tomorrow i can actually give more to my clients yeah so um so yeah i've, I've done this dummy course with project you i'm doing little bits of it through weller of course i do little bits with fame team i did a few little pop-up sessions with um various salons throughout the lockdowns so it's almost like i've built this kind of giant thesis and um I'm just pulling little bits out of it here and there as they're kind of requested of me. And is I don't really goal, know what the future looks like. Yeah, I was going to say, is oh, the yeah. goal of it to have like a, a day course, a, a week course? Is it like a retreat? Like, what do you know? What are we going to do? I think, I think all of that stuff, like I'm doing a session tonight with Tony and Guy because you know, New South Wales has just gone into lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, guys, let's get you all to together. I'm going to do a little hour and a half session on resilience. That's so good. And um, you're doing this. God, you're good. You're good. Yeah, but I, I, like, I like talking. I like yeah. talking. I like listening as well. You know, I really like listening. I like listening to people's stories. Um, I'm doing a day with Wella um, for some of their students. And um, I think you're. Do you so know what I'd really like to do? What? The pipe dream, I think, for me is like, like Tony and Guy, we, we, I've got lots of conversations going on at the moment with our like, head of education who's based in yeah. Japan. And there's a guy in London, Fotis, who does, um, he's kind of pioneering this type of education as well. So the three of us have these meetings about, okay, well, how does this education look like? Can we start to bring it into Tony and Guy's core education somehow? So there's so many conversations going on. And what we keep coming back to is like, let's just like feel it out let's just keep doing these little pop-up sessions Good here feeling. and there what works what doesn't make sure there's awareness but I almost want to set up like a board of lots of other hairdressers within Australia um from different backgrounds different product companies where we get together a few times a year and say all right how do we promote emotional well-being education within the industry is it something that starts to need to shift within the TAFE you know syllabuses yeah. is there do we need to have um I don't know books what what does it look like I think I'm someone that doesn't have all the answers but I'm you I'm have very these ideas about yeah facilitate it yeah totally. I want to facilitate the conversation so I think yeah I guess I'm just championing and um waving the flag for emotional well-being education within hairdressing and it's all evolving really really nicely yeah. at the moment I, I just have to make sure that imposter syndrome stuff doesn't kick in. <laughs> yeah, well, it won't. No, We're going to yeah. work on that. <laughs> I had this amazing moment. I did a course with Ash and Kyra from TK Studio last oh, weekend. Yeah. And exactly what you're talking about, it's not something that maybe I think about as often as others do, maybe. You know, I, I don't mm -hmm. dive as deep into myself as maybe you do or Charlene would or, you know, and that's yeah. the thing that I really like about having people like that around me is that it takes mm. these conversations somewhere further that I wouldn't always maybe direct in that way. But yeah. I had never been in a color course that had a mental health segment to it. 
and they uh, had one of their staff members who I don't know if she's like kind of done the same thing like a few courses or it's just something she's very aware of and she presented her model which was amazing but part of what she spoke about was the heaviness of this year on us and how are we yeah. going to direct the conversation and you know all of these things and they mm. had an osteo come in and an osteo went yeah. through stretching our bodies and this thing yeah. to put up on the wall and I was like oh my god I know to do all that but do I ever do it no <laughs> I don't I literally yeah. never ever do and I yeah. just thought it was this like thing that I was like duh like you know and it's what obviously you are talking about and what you think is yeah. important and it was just it was really refreshing I think as much as it was a color course I really took that away from it yeah, well, I think this is it. Like, I have so many conversations around this these days, and you know, the the conversation is happening. Like, people, we know the importance of having good mental health and good physical health because if those two things aren't in place, all of those skills that we've learned as hairdressers, those hard skills, and even some of the soft skills of communication, they've got nothing to sit on. Mm -hmm. Like, and we know as hairdressers, if our bodies don't work or if we're not in a good mood, the other things don't work totally. but then it's like well how do we do it we have to seek all of those things out so much in our own time outside of the industry and time. it's a bit harder to do so it needs to happen within the space or so I love the fact that you know Kyra's salon was slipped that in it you know really and great. um yeah it's great so yeah we just need to just keep having the conversation keep yeah. reminding ourselves but I do think we need to have stuff within the industry that's spoken about by hairdressers with a hairdresser's language you know yeah um, that, which that's is my so dream anyway. cool that like you are doing this because a big thing I mean I've said it once I said it a thousand times we feel like I feel like a lot of times I'm not qualified for the like some of these yeah. conversations like I don't know you know I just tell you exactly what you said my thoughts my thought or my opinion it's not the right or the wrong the same way with you directing a shoot on on the hair yeah it, it's just navigating those things and I think it is really important to have something in place like that because it's the it's like the ongoing joke that the hairdresser is your therapist but it's not really a joke <laughs> it's actually but true. then who's, who's the hairdresser's therapist yeah, you know? who's, who's totally. our therapist? who are we offloading and you know, I keep saying all the time with all of this mental well-being stuff is I don't have the answers, but I'm very good at asking the questions. And sometimes people people have their own answers, their own answers themselves, or even just talking things through, they feel so much better. Like, God, I mean, we're all very good at hairdressers asking questions. You know, we need to be asking each other questions yeah. as well. And actually, I'll tell you what's interesting is um, I'm jumping around a bit, but being back okay. in at work the last couple of weeks after um, the last lockdown is. I would say 90% of my clients, 100% of my clients are miserable. Everyone's fed up. They've had a, they've had a bad yeah. time. And and what they keep saying, you know, I let them offload. I ask them. I get them yeah. to talk and whinge and moan and offload. because It's not targeted at me. And they go, oh, you know, and I feel, I feel so bad for moaning because, you know, I've still got a job. I've still got a roof over my head. And it's like, but it, it helps you. You need, like, offloading like that, having a yeah. little moan. They then leave, go, oh, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. I've got perspective now I can pick myself up but we, we do need to offload to a point we have to yeah. let those emotions like go through us like I haven't said anything that's fixed her or I'm giving her a new perspective I on things I just ask the question just let her talk yeah. yeah and that's sometimes all we need to do we don't need to have the answers um just and normally our clients I think what I took from that conversation, that course and listening to Steph talk was, she said, normally we have, you know, one client in the week or one client in the day who's maybe having a divorce or this is what I took. I actually don't even know if she said this. I might be making this up. This is what I took from it. That yeah. you have one client who has lost their job, had a breakup, had something, but the rest of your clients are going away for the weekend or off to Europe or having this amazing thing. You have one person in that circle that is putting something on you and you think about them and you know, that's that. But when you mm. have every single client every single mm. day for a year or a month or whatever we've been doing that's where it yeah. becomes tricky it's heavy it's heavy yeah. yeah and that that is again exactly where I think we need our own space we don't we need our own courses for us to offload so yeah. that we can be a bit more resilient within those but we don't absorb too much of our clients negativity um 
yeah we, we need to offload as well we need to build so ourselves good. up as well so good yeah. i love i love that for you i love that to the board all of it like put me in the corner with a mic <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you can be the roaming like journalist oh my God. Like it, but. but you know what is so cool and it is a takeaway for people to listen about this industry is that yes we're hairdressing and that is not the only thing that we have to do like mm. I've discovered this kind of platform that I would have never gotten to had I not been doing hairdressing yeah. and you're discovering this self-development and you know therapy yeah. all these things that maybe that was your something that you could have done as a career but because it's now done through hairdressing it's even more fun it's even better absolutely There's, you know yeah. it's not yeah. that you have to be in this one confined space of being in the salon you get to yep. branch out and have a different career I get to be a tv host <laughs> always <laughs> wanted to be on tv <laughs> But now you are a little Zoom TV. I mean, I, this is the brilliant thing about the world now. You know, these these channels, these paths. The um, you know, we all have different side hustles as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, and I think something, you know, a bigger problem about kind of opening a whole can of worms is that you know, globally, we do have a crisis with hairdressing recruitment where people yeah. don't necessarily want to be hairdressers anymore. And I wonder if part of it as well is um, that there isn't enough kind of emotional nurturing within our industry or the promotion mm. of all the other stuff that it takes like you might think oh it's about making hair look beautiful and then you kind of come into the salon space and you realize oh god it's about talking lots and standing up all day and doing lots of physical labor and um yeah all of those other parts i, I think other people maybe don't know um yeah. i know again it's harder to for the younger generation to talk so much now where everything's just done behind a screen over text it's uh, we're losing the art of communication a bit as well so um yeah again i just want to make sure that we've got all of those that support with our within our industry the promotion that you can there's all these other things that you can do and also we're going to support you with all those other things as well yeah i think because a lot of times to too in. like if you work in a company or you know they have hr or they have that was something i always found interesting mm. in a salon we we had a lady who was the hr lady and then she left and then we didn't have anybody else and then who do you go mm. to when you need, you know, and you're going to your yeah. own staff member, like implementing something. Why in a biz, a, I don't know, a, an office type setting, do they have those facilities mm. or, you know, they have part of their package is they have medical and they can go to therapy. Absolutely. And they can go, why don't we have that as hairdressers? Why, why don't we? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like, we asked the question. So yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be part of the solution. Yeah. Now, you know? And, um, and I also know what's brilliant is now that I'm starting the conversation or even like slightly promoting these type of things on Instagram is the amount of like response that you get from totally. people. Um, even like the guys at um, Area Academy, you know, like the barbers, you know, they're like, we, mm -hmm. we love this. We want more of this. Let's have conversation. So <gasps> everybody recognizes the, the <laughs> we recognize the need for it. Yeah. And now it's just like, okay, let's start implementing things. I've really loved the connection that I've gotten through this with the barbers too. Like I've had Owen on, oh, he's been so yeah. good to me. And we, I did the color for one of his entries for some, like just the collaboration oh, between the industries that sometimes yeah. it was quite separated. I'm really yeah. enjoying that vibe. One of my girlfriends sent a flyer for one of the barbershops opening things next week. And I was like, yeah, let's go. Like, whereas I don't think I ever would have maybe done that before. Like, am I welcome here? You know, like, yeah, I think absolutely. It's, it's so such cool. a, the, the community is opened up. Like we all want to lift each other up as well. We do all want to support each other and draw on each other's education. And again, that social media that's done that, we're all intrigued. This is what everybody else is doing and almost forced into sharing what we're doing. Nothing's a secret anymore, is it? Yeah. Like, um, we yeah like, we're all sharing our skill set, sharing how we feel. And um, yeah, there's room for everyone. This might be a loaded question. I feel like we're getting to yeah. our time and I never want to go. But what's the yeah. one thing that you do want to give to the next Gen like if you're saying someone considering hairdressing or not considering hairdressing like what do you want them to know that they can get out of this industry I think it's that fundamental thing of you get everything you want out of life when you help somebody else get what they want like through mm. as fundamental as going into a salon 
talking to a client about them having a tin and then having a 20 minute chat with them and making them feel better. One makes you feel better, but they also ask you about yourself and your life and you figure yourself out as well. It's just this, um, yeah, just that promotion of, there's so much heart in our industry if, if you let it, you know, if, you, if, yeah. if your fundamental driver behind hairdressing is to make somebody else feel better, you will feel so much better yourself as well and you will understand yourself like you'll understand people so much better so yeah it goes way beyond just making someone look pretty it's about making them like feel really pretty yeah and um yeah it comes back to you in spades um Beautiful. yeah and it's really nice for me to constantly remind myself about as well it's something I never forget like I adore my clients I adore my yeah day-to-day chat chat with them and you know and I as you can probably tell I do talk about myself a lot as well you know so um yeah I've learned so much so. more about myself at least if you're interesting clients. and you're talking about yourself <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks mate you go all right yourself as well <laughs> not too shabby anything else you feel like we haven't touched on that I mean I know there's a thousand million things we could go in but anything that you specifically wanted that we haven't covered no, not really. I, I, we've covered a lot of stuff. But again, I yeah. just want to say like, well done. Well done Thank for you. you for like taking the initiative to do something <laughs> like this. And it's the same as me. Like I pat myself on the back a little bit for kind mm-hmm. of like starting this project you. And it's when I, when I listen to other hairdressers maybe complaining about things, it's like, cool, we'll be part of the solution. You know, mm-hmm. like pick up your pen, pick up the phone, like just start something. Yeah. You know, I so I love the fact agree. you've done this. Oh, and I want to encourage every other hairdresser to, take some initiative to encourage change um within our industry within your own lives you know love it 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 is something that I think even when I said creative director to you or you know we have this little bit of an issue taking credit people are like oh good for you like I you know I get lots of messages about it and I feel funny sometimes being like yeah "Yeah, (laughs) to come on the podcast or so (laughs) people are actually asking me now which is like what (laughs) it just yeah it's 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 testament to you it's really really nice and I feel really grateful and I I just struggle sometimes with the time now that's my only when I was saying to you how do you find the time to like do each Mm. of these things and do clients in the salon that's the only part I'm struggling with a little bit now that I've gone out on my own I'm my Mm. own receptionist I'm doing you know Mm. in my color order doing my clients I'm doing 12 hour days because it's just me and then I have to not that I have to do this I want to do this want to do it And I've really just been actually being like, you know what, stuff it. You're taking that extra day off in the week and that is going to come back to you tenfold because yes, I'm not getting paid to do three podcasts a day on my today, (laughs) but you know, and I just have to, I have to do it because I can see that this is going to be important and that people are coming around it. And it's the same for you. You do that project, you in your own time, not getting paid really, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you have to remember that it, yeah, it does come back to you tenfold. It almost as much as it drains my energy, it ultimately gives me energy. That's I think these things cool. as well, you have to get into a different headspace as well of like not seeing it like work. You know, like just seeing mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go home tonight. I'm gonna have a chat with somebody on a podcast, or a bit like mm-hmm. I'll come home tonight and I'm gonna read those books and write that PowerPoint. Like it's about yeah. switching how you're thinking about it. That it, that helps me. Yeah, that's a great. That's great advice. Love it. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go because I know you have a seminar to give tonight. My goodness. Good for you. Thank you so much. Oh, my internet's going a bit funny. Yeah. Good timing. My signal's going. Oh, good. Let it be bad for them. (laughs) Yeah. too cute. All right. Well, I love chatting with you. And thank you. I really appreciate this. And I loved that you wanted to do it. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, good luck with all your future ventures. I'll screw I'll see you at a pub with Charlene sometime oh, yeah. soon. We're getting her on next. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> it'll be good. Yeah, it'll be very good. She's a good talker. Love it. All right. Thank you, Jack. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Successful Stylist Unfoiled. Don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube to get all the notifications of our weekly episodes.